all you Knox County students. My name is Chris Cavallaris and I'm a teacher at Farragut Middle School. Today I'm going to uh, talk to you about the election of 1860, uh, secession, and what that means, and the Battle of Fort Sumter. And so I uh, hope you enjoy this lesson. Uh, there will be um, some activities that you'll be doing, uh, some note taking that you'll be doing, uh, and hopefully some uh, learning that's gonna be going on. KCS at Home, Summer Edition, Social Studies, eighth grade, activity one. Uh, if you're having difficulty understanding this video, uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, quick tips. Uh, you can turn on closed caption. If available, adjust the playback speed to slow down the video. Consider watching short clips, then pause and listen and watch again and someone in your home to watch the video with you. Uh, this will stop frequently and talk to your uh, partner, your parent, your brother, your sister, cousin, uncle, nephew, grandmother uh, about uh, what you heard and uh, what you understand. In order to complete this lesson, uh, you will need a pencil uh, for the note-taking guide of the election of 1860. You'll need color pencils and markers because you'll be uh, creating a couple of different things during this activity. Uh, in order to create those things, you'll need one blank piece of printer paper. Uh, that'll be for a, a campaign poster. Uh, I would uh, personally cut that piece of paper in half uh, long ways and that way you'll have to you'll uh, have less to do uh, but you do you uh, and then there's also a printer version of the newspaper activity uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page um, right here is the election of 1860 notes uh, and this will just help you as we follow along that way you can keep the uh, main candidates uh, organized and it'll help you understand uh, what you're learning and so uh, that is what you will need for today's lesson. Uh, like I said before, it is the election of 1860, secession, and then the Battle of Fort Sumter, which is conveniently uh, gonna be the picture that is uh, on this screen. Uh, before we start though, uh, on the back of your note-taking guide or on a separate sheet of paper, whichever one you would prefer, uh, I want us to uh, remind ourselves about uh, the buildup to the Civil War. Um, how I teach it, it's the road to the Civil War, and I have different road markers uh, on alternate uh, sides of the road. Uh, but to, in order to answer the journal entry, we have to go back and we have to look at uh, some of the things that were causing disunion in the United States. The first is the Compromise of 1850, uh, and it goes back way beyond that. You can argue that it starts in Jamestown. Uh, it, it could; uh, these are just the ones that are very uh, close to the onset of the Civil War. Uh, the Compromise of 1850, uh, and that is where California was admitted into the Union as a free state, and slave trade, but not necessarily slavery, uh, was outlawed in our nation's capital in Washington D.C. Um, but there was a stricter Fugitive Slave Act that was uh, instituted and that was, or enacted, um, and that was uh, pretty much allowing anybody, uh, especially bounty hunters, to be a, a, a deputy sheriff and go in and capture uh, potential runaway slaves. Uh, there was Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1852, and this was Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, Stowe's writing, um, that uh, circulated around the country. It was actually second um, in uh, books sold uh, behind the Bible, and uh, it had an, it depicted slavery in a negative image. This was uh, written because Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, saw a uh, slave auction, uh, and she saw a mother and child be separated uh, during that uh, during that auction. You have the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854. Uh, which was going to allow uh, these new territories that were going to uh, start to try to become more civilized to actually be able to vote on whether they wanted to be slavery, uh, slave uh, states, or whether they wanted to be free states. Uh, this led into Bleeding Kansas, where you had John Brown uh, and several other people come in to try to attack uh, the southern border ruffians that would come in and try to uh, vote for slavery. Uh, and where we have uh, uh, several people that were killed during this instance. And you have Dred Scott v. Sanford, and this was uh, where Dred Scott, who was a slave, 
his owner took him up to the north uh, to work at a at a army fort, and uh, um, he sued. Dredge got sued for his freedom. He said, "I can't be a slave in a free state. By definition, a free state is you're free." Uh, and the Supreme Court came back and ruled that property cannot sue for their freedom and even took it a step further in saying that African Americans cannot, uh, cannot sue. Uh, and then you have John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. And this is the same John Brown that was a uh, part of the Bleeding Kansas incident. Uh, he goes over and he tries to, uh, um, tries to storm the fort at Harper's Ferry where they kept the armory or, or where the armory was, um, where they kept a bunch of the gun or the army's weapons and guns. It was a failed attempt. Uh, general Robert E. Lee actually wasn't a general yet, but Robert E. Lee, uh, came in and he actually stopped them, uh, from happening and, uh, ended up John Brown being executed, um, for, um, uh, for going against the government. So with all of those being uh, reminded about and talked about, I would like you to complete this journal entry. Based off of what we have learned, uh, hopefully you have learned this uh, better than what I've reviewed it, uh, about the causes of the Civil War, explain which event would have upset you the most, if you are a Southerner and if you are a Northerner. And so what I would recommend you do right here is uh, to go back to this page, maybe pause it, uh, and try to figure out and try to remind yourselves of what these events were uh, and then come back to this and pause it and then try to complete this. Uh, James Buchanan was a Democrat. He was president. He was elected president in 1856, uh, but he decided when, uh, with all this disunion that was going on and with uh, the country on the brink of not knowing what to do, are we going to be free? Are we going to be slavery? Or, you know, Lincoln and Douglas had had their debates for the Senate seat in Illinois, and, the, and Lincoln famously gave his house divided speech, and, and you could tell that tensions were boiling. And so James Buchanan decided that he was not going to run for re-election. Uh, now, this is a big deal, because if you're president and you're fit to run for re-election, then, then typically you're going to. Uh, there, there's going to be very few reasons that's going to hold you back from uh from trying to pursue a re-election bid. But he stepped down and he said, I'm not gonna run for re-election. And so this left the presidency seat vacant. Uh, now he was still president until the next person came in, but there wasn't going to be uh, just an automatic fill in. So several men uh, came in and, they, and it was a pretty contested uh, uh, battle. And so we're going to learn about some of the men who were running for the presidential seat of 1860. One of the first ones that was uh, probably one of the more famous ones uh, was uh, the Northern Democrat, uh, uh, Stephen Douglas. And he was a strong proponent of popular sovereignty. And if you remember what popular sovereignty is, it's just the right to vote. Um, it's, uh, and you're going to vote on whether you're going to be free or whether you're going to be slave. He said that he doesn't have uh, opinions on it, that it should be the opinion of the people that make the decision. It should be the people that reside in that state, in that territory, in that providence, whatever. It needs to be their decision on whether you're going to be um, free or slave. And so he is a Northern Democrat. There's also a Southern Democrat, and his name was John C. Breckinridge of Tennessee. Uh, and he said that he would uphold slavery. Uh, they were both in the same political party as just one was Northern, one was Southern, uh, but the whole entire party was split. The Democrats were split on the um, stance of slavery. Southern Democrats still wanted to uphold slavery, um, but they weren't going to um, get along with the Northern Democrats uh, on every single issue because they're going to be um, arguing over uh, slavery and, and whether it was just or not. The, uh, another man in the Constitutional Union Party um, and he was a moderate from the North and the South formed the, uh, they formed this party. Uh, he was actually from Tennessee, uh, John Bell. Uh, and he said, I take no issue or I take no position on slavery. Uh, I'm not going to say whether it's good or whether it's bad. I'm just going to say it's there and it exists. Uh, and so he didn't get that much support because regardless of which side you're going to, that, that you would have been on in 1860, uh, you're pretty passionate about it. There was very few people that uh, looked at the issue of slavery and didn't have a strong opinion. 
you're either going to be pro-slavery or anti-slavery. And that leads us to the Republicans. The Republicans wanted to leave slavery alone where it existed, but not let it expand to any other part of the United States. Uh, so Abraham Lincoln came in and he said, Southern states, you keep slavery. You can, you can have your slaves, but any other territory that comes about, any other state that, that uh, applies for admission into the Union, they will not be able to have slaves. And so the Southerners were very upset with this. And one of the reasons they're upset with this, the main reason they're upset is that now that would leave them uh, where they're gonna always be outvoted in Congress. They would never have the representation that the free states would have because all of a sudden they can't expand, but free states can. Uh, and so that leads to the election. So your very first task that you're, um, that you're asked to complete is on a blank sheet of paper, a printer paper. Uh, now remember, I would cut it in half, but you don't have to, but I would. Uh, I would like you to create a campaign poster in support of one of the candidates in the election of 1860. Your poster should include your candidate's name and picture, uh, the candidate's party, uh, you have the Northern Democrats, the Southern Democrats, the Constitutional Union, and the um, Republican. Uh, beliefs of that political party, I would focus on the ideas of slavery, and then some type of patriotic symbol and slogan. Uh, I would go back, maybe rewind it, and watch a little bit of it. I would refer back to your um, note-taking guide, uh, and I would try to create this and hopefully uh, show it to your parents and maybe uh, put it on the refrigerator or get a magnet, put it on the refrigerator or, um, or hang it on a bulletin board or do something with it. Uh, and I'm sure you're doing a great job. So go ahead and give yourself a check mark, smiley face and full credit because I'm sure it is an amazing campaign poster. So continuing on, the results were that the Democrat, with the Democrats divided, Lincoln won a clear majority of the electoral votes. Uh, those were the two main political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, much like today. Uh, but the problem with the Democrats were that they were divided between Northern popular sovereignty and Southern uphold slavery. And so those votes were split and Lincoln uh, won with the vast majority. Uh, he won with the vast majority, even though his name did not appear on many of the Southern ballots. Uh, like, Southerners couldn't even vote for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it's not that he just didn't win the state. He wasn't even on the ballot. He wasn't even able to be voted for uh, because they were so adamant that they didn't want him to be president that they just took his name off of the ballot. Um, but he won every Northern state. And so, the northern states, since they were more populous, since they had more uh, population, they had more people, uh, they had a more electoral votes, and uh, Lincoln won pretty easily. If you look at the electoral map of 1860, uh, one of the on your note-taking guide, it, it asks you to um, to count up all the um, all, all the electoral votes that each candidate received, uh, but you can tell. Uh, just by looking at um, Pennsylvania and New York, that they are highly populated. Uh, and if you add up all of these, they're not going to come close to equal, all the southern states. They're not going to be able to uh, come close to adding up to, um, to the northern states along with the free states of California. Um, and so uh, there you go. Uh, Lincoln won even though he was not on any of the Southern ballots. So pause this for a second and try to calculate and see how many, um, how many electoral votes Lincoln, Douglas, Breckinridge, and Bell each received. Uh, I'll go ahead and help you out. Douglas received 12. Uh, some people will just say nine, but if you look over here, there was three right over here uh, on, the, um, on the side between Connecticut and New Jersey. So right after that, um, I mean, it was, Lincoln hadn't even taken office yet. And South Carolina says, peace, I'm out of here. I'm gone. Uh, we're going to leave. We're succeeding from the Union. Uh, succeed means to withdraw 
from a union, alliance, or political organization. So they said, we're leaving the United States of America. We are no longer a part of the United States of America. And several states are going to uh, are going to join them shortly after. But I want us to look at this uh, this artist depiction of what it was like um, for the southern state to succeed from the union. Uh, and let's analyze this real quick. You have two men sitting on what appears to be the wrong end of a branch that they're trying to saw off. Uh, they're trying to leave the union tree. Uh, if, if you notice how on the, uh, the, the trunk, the body of the tree, it says union right here. Uh, and they're sawing away. And uh, if they are successful, uh, what's going to happen to them? They're going to fall. Uh, they're, it's not going to end well for them. So even if they are successful in accomplishing what they, the goal that they've set out to do, it's not going to end well. You're going to have these two men that are going to saw themselves off of a tree and fall down to the ground and probably hurt themselves. So I want you to try to think, do you think this was a Southern depiction of succession or would it be a Northern? And hopefully, you can see that it would be a northerner's viewpoint of the states, the southern states succeeding from the union, uh, because what's going to happen? They're going to fall, and even if they're successful, it's not going to end well. And so it's this is succession fever in the South. Uh, so your guided notes are done. So right after South Carolina succeeded in December twentieth, Mississippi. Uh, uh, succeeded less than a month away uh, later in January 9th, uh, still less than a month away. Florida did on the January 10th. Alabama the next day on the 11th. Uh, Georgia that following week, a week, couple of days later, uh, in the 19th. Louisiana in the, on the 26th. And Texas finally did on February 1st. But this, is, this isn't going to be the only states that succeed from the Union. These are just the ones that did it very quickly. Uh, Abraham Lincoln still has not taken office. He hasn't been sworn into office. He hasn't given his inaugural address. He, he has just been elected president. He is president-elect at this point. Uh, and so uh, Jefferson Davis was elected president of the Confederate States of America. Now, he is from Mississippi. Uh, he was a senator from Mississippi, and uh, he fought in the uh, uh, Mexican-American War. Uh, he, was, uh, Adam, uh, he was a strong supporter of the Southern cause, and he was the one that was elected president. He actually gave his own uh, inaugural address as well. We're not going to look at that, but he was president of the Confederate States of America. Uh, but there were several other states that hadn't succeeded yet. Uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, Go Vols, uh, Missouri, Delaware, Maryland, and Arkansas. And people are wondering what is going to happen with these states. Uh, are these states going to stay with the Union? Are they going to abolish slavery? Are they going to join the Confederacy? What's going to happen with them? Uh, these states had a convention uh, to, to vote on whether they're going to leave. Tennessee's was um, whenever um, we went to vote, uh, it, we, we decided to stay with the Union. Uh, West Tennessee, which was mostly uh, slaveholding and Middle Tennessee as well, um, they wanted to leave, but East Tennessee did not. Um, East Tennessee is filled with uh, ridges and valleys and mountains and plateaus and rocky soil. And there's very few slave owning people, slave owners who uh, lived in East Tennessee. And so the very first time that we voted to leave the Union, we decided to stay with the United States of America. Um, but this is shortly going to change. So Lincoln gives his inaugural address. And in, in his inaugural address, he says, in your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no earth registered in heaven to destroy the government while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. So we're going to pause right there and we're going to look at these words. He says, you, you can have no conflict without you being the aggressors. So he's saying there will not be a fight. There will not be any issues. There will not be any war unless you cause it. 
one, if you cause it, it, it could happen. It will happen if you cause it, but we're not going to cause it. And says, while I still have the most solemn oath, the most solemn uh, one to preserve, protect, and defend it. This is him saying, uh, I, I ain't going to be punked out here. You're going to either follow along or you're going to be the aggressors. And please try not to be aggressors. I want us to stay together, but my job is to preserve, protect, and defend it. He goes on to say, I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained it, uh, must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the union when again touched as surely as they will be by the better angels of our nature. He's saying, please don't follow your instincts. Please don't follow your gut reaction, your knee jerk reaction. Let us not break our affection with each other. We are countrymen. We are brothers. We are friends. And he says, we are not enemies. He is sitting there as poetically as he can, trying to, trying to talk these Southerners into not uh, succeeding from the Union. He's saying, please just come back. We're friends. We're not enemies. He says that twice. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies, though passion may have strained. He's saying, I know you're passionate about this. I know it, but please, let's try to work through this. We have these bonds of affection and let it not be broken. Um, he's, he, he can't be any more adamant about this. He's trying to say, please do not be an aggressor. Please do not force a war upon us. Please understand I have three jobs to preserve, protect, and defend the United States of America. That didn't work too well because um, Southerners were upset. Uh, on, in April of 1861 in Charleston Harbor, uh, there's a fort. It's called Fort Sumter, and it was within the state boundaries. It's, it's in the Charleston Bay, um, but it is technically in state boundaries of South Carolina, but it is a federal fort. Now, Lincoln had withdrawn from all forts except two in the South, and Charleston was one of them. And South Carolinians were very upset because they were saying, this is our land, get off of it. We left the United States of America. We're gone, we're out of here. Um, we're no longer considering ourselves Americans, we're South Carolinians. And so they said, get out. And they surrounded the fort and they tried to starve the soldiers of the fort out. They, they said, we're not letting any supplies in. Well, if you know a, a fort in the middle of a bay, it can't produce its own uh, supplies, its own food, its own water, it, its own necessities. And so they needed to be resupplied. So on April 12th at 4.30, uh, Confederates fire on the fort. Lincoln had tried to send in supplies, um, but due to uh, uh, strong tides and uh, um, the fort being surrounded at uh, uh, Fort Moultrie, um, they weren't able to. And the bombardment began. And this is when the Civil War officially starts. It's 34 hours of constant firing. And finally, the, uh, the Union surrenders Fort Sumter. Uh, to your left, you'll see a picture of Fort Sumter today. Now, it is uh, right off the coast of Charleston. If you've ever been to Charleston, you might have seen it. Um, it's, uh, it's a very beautiful uh, um, national uh, park, uh, part of the national park system. Uh, you have to take a ferry out from uh, Charleston Harbor, and you, uh, you uh, float out to, uh, to the fort, and you go around. You can tour it for a little bit. Um, and you're surrounded on by the right, if you look at the picture on the right, uh, Fort Johnston, Johnson and Fort Moultrie. And this right here shows you what it looks like up close. So whenever you see that it's surrounded, it is completely surrounded. It was fired upon for 34 hours. So here's a little video that shows what happens at Fort Sumter. Waiting for Lincoln on his first day in office was a letter from Major Robert Anderson, the commander of Fort Sumter located on an island in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina. 
Anderson warned that without a shipment of provisions, he would have to surrender to the rebels. Lincoln had three options. He could order a surrender, an attack, or send provisions. He chose the latter. So basically, Lincoln said to Jefferson Davis, if you let this food go in peacefully, it will be uh, a, a symbolic manifestation of our sovereignty over this fort, the United States sovereignty. If you stop it, then the burden of responsibility for starting a war will be on your shoulders. Before Lincoln's supply ships arrived, Confederate President Jefferson Davis ordered his men to attack the fort. The first shot was fired. On April 12th, 1861, the Civil War had begun. Violence at Fort Sumter motivated four more states to join the Confederacy. Four others remained on the fence. Fort Sumter was surrendered to the South, but Major Anderson saved the American flag that had flown above it and brought it to New York City. They took that tattered, ripped flag. It was very much like the World Trade Center flag that was displayed all over New York in the fall of 2001. And the flag inspired them, created flag mania, patriotic fear. In a way, without Sumter, Lincoln might not have stirred up the Union um, to a move that was necessary to fight, to restore the Union, to preserve it. By an act of shrewd calculation, Lincoln had baited the South into striking the first blow of the Civil War. Yet neither he nor Jefferson Davis anticipated what was about to unfold. So now... Uh, your next task is to uh, pretend you're a newspaper reporter, reporter covering the events at Charleston, South Carolina. You'll be rep reporting on the Battle of Fort Sumter from an assigned perspective. Uh, so before you begin, I'm going to tell you what your assigned perspective will be, but it mu your um, newspaper must include a newspaper name, a catchy headline, an article, one picture with a caption, and a picture of the author, which is you, and about yourself, which is where you brag on yourself. You can make something up, uh, just whatever you would want your Instagram followers to know. Um, this is what you would do. The name of the newspaper uh, goes right here. Uh, if you follow this area, the headline goes right here. Uh, the, pic the picture of the event and the caption right here. Uh, your article on both of these lines and the about the author where you brag, you draw your picture in the, in the smaller box and the about the author in the larger box, uh, and you complete this. Now this is also found in your task one uh, social studies folder, so hopefully you're able to print it out. Um, and so you can pause this video as you complete that task. But first, your, this is your assigned um, perspective. If your birth dates were um, from between January or June, you're going to cover the Battle of Fort Sumter from a Southern perspective, from a Confederate perspective. If you were born in the months of July and December, uh, your battle, your is the Battle of Fort Sumter from a Union perspective. So you'd be covering it as someone who's upset about the, um, the fort being attacked. And uh, continuing on, the aftermath of Fort Sumter was Lincoln's uh, response was to call for 75,000 volunteer troops. Uh, in Ohio, it was built within only 16 days. Uh, Kentucky, who is going to remain a border state and not a slave or not a Confederate state, they uh, um, they say Kentucky will furnish no troops for this wicked purpose of subduing her sister Southern states. Uh, and as soon as Lincoln's call for troops, this leads to uh, these uh, Virginia, Arkansas, North Carolina, and Tennessee all succeeding right after that. And so that is when you have the full might of the Confederate States of America uh, complete going up against the United States of America, the Union. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, lesson. I hope uh, you've learned a little bit about uh, Fort Sumter, about the uh, election of 1860, about the, um, 
the first seven states that succeeded from the union. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact your teacher, uh, or you can look up my email. Once again, it's uh, Christopher.Cavalaris at KnoxSchools.org. Uh, if you don't know how to spell it, that's cool. Uh, go to the Farragut Middle School website uh, and look for me. Uh, it's eighth grade social studies. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this lesson and have a good rest of the summer.